Every time you load a website, send a message, or join a multiplayer game, your computer is talking to another one. And the tool they use to talk, it's called a socket. Think of a socket like a phone line. One end plugs into your device, the other connects to someone else's. Once both sides are plugged in, boom, you have got a two-way conversation going. In simple terms, a socket is a combo of an IP address, which identifies the device, and a port number, which identifies the app or service on that device. Together, this makes a socket address. Kind of like saying, send this letter to 123 Main Street, Apartment 22. So, when you open Chrome and type www.google.com, here is what actually happening behind the scenes. Chrome creates a client socket. Google server is already waiting with the listening socket. The moment Chrome connects, Google replies using that socket and they start talking. And sockets aren't just for browsing. They power real-time chat apps, multiplayer games, dashboards, file sharing, IoT devices. Mastering sockets gives you the superpowers for building connected systems. In this video, we'll break down how sockets work from beginner to advanced. What exactly is a socket? How does it relate to connections and requests? What's going on behind the scenes in your code? And how do tools like Nginx handle millions of open sockets efficiently? We'll even build a working socket chat app using Python and explore how modern systems scale with ePoll and KQ. By the end, you won't just know what socket is, you'll understand how to use it like a pro. Let's dive in. A socket is like a pie between the server and the client. It stays open for the entire communication. When a client, like your browser, talks to the server, it establishes a TCP connection through a socket. A connection is a socket in this context. You can think of them interchangeably here. A request is what travels inside the connection. It could be an HTTP GET request to load a web page, an HTTP POST request to submit a form, or a WebSocket message. And there are two major types of sockets, stream sockets and datagram sockets. Stream sockets, aka TCP sockets, are reliable ordered communication, like a phone call. If you ever watch Netflix, data is being streamed using stream sockets or TCP, ensuring the video arrives in the right order, without glitches. Datagram sockets or UDP are fast, but some might get lost. Many multiplayer games use UDP sockets because speed matters more than perfection. If one shot gets missed, it's okay, but you can't afford lag or slowness. So in simple words, one connection client is one socket. That socket may handle one or more requests depending on how things are set up. For example, HTTP Keep Alive or WebSockets. In basic HTTP 1.0, one connection is one request. And in HTTP 1.1 or HTTP 2, multiple requests can happen on a single connection. Now here is the deal. A socket is just a software object, kind of a, like a placeholder or endpoint. It's not physical like a water pipe. In Python, if you write import socket s equal to socket dot socket, boom, you have created a socket object. But under the hood, your code talks to the operating system. The socket function call asks the OS, hey, can you create a new communication endpoint for me? The OS says, sure, here is a file descriptor. Think of file descriptor like a ticket. Use it to send or receive data. This ticket, the socket handle, lets your program read from and write to the network, just like you would with a file. Now, if you are the client, you use s.connect bitemunk.io at 80. Your program says to the OS, please initiate a TCP handshake to bitemunk.io on port 80. And the OS handles all the messy low-level stuff, such as IP routing, DNS resolution, and finally, if successful, it links your socket to real TCP connection. Once that's done, now you're ready to send data. It's like a tunnel. So when you do s.send, at this point, the socket handle is used again, this time to write bytes into the kernel buffer, which gets pushed out to the network. You send data into the socket and it comes out on the other side, on the server. And when you do s.receive1024, the handle is used to read data from the kernel buffer that came back from the server. So, to be super clear, socket creates handle. It reserves a network endpoint with the OS. Connect initiates connection to target IP port. Send sends the data over the network via the connection. 
receive reads response data from the network buffer and close tells OS to release the socket. And if you are the server, you write this. Here, the OS binds your program to a port and starts watching for incoming connections. And when someone knocks on the door, it handles you a new socket already connected to the client. Even though you are dealing with a software object, the data physically travels through your computer's network interface card or NIC, then to your router and then out to the internet. But you don't have to deal with that. The OS abstracts all that away. Your code just talks to the socket object. The socket talks to the network stack. The stack talks to the hardware and poof, you are connected. Okay, let's go hands on. We'll build a super simple chat system. Just one server and one client using Python's built-in socket module. No extra libraries needed. Here, we create a socket, bind it to localhost and port 3000. We wait for a client to connect using dot .listen and dot .accept. And then, receive messages and echo them back. This client here connects to the server on localhost 3000, sends messages typed by the user, and prints back whatever response the server sends. Here is how it's working. I'm running the server script in one terminal and running the client in another. Now they are talking over a socket. So if you try typing hello in the client window, you'll see the server responding with received hello. Just like that, you have created your own real-time socket connection. It's basic, but it's the same core idea used in large-scale systems. Open a socket, connect, talk. Now, when you write a code like this in Python, you might wonder, where are these methods really implemented? Is Python doing the networking? The short answer, no. Python isn't doing the heavy lifting. It's just calling into lower level code that's already built into your operating system. Here is what really happens. Python has a socket module written in C that wraps system level socket APIs. These APIs come from the OS kernel, not Python itself. So when you call connect or dot send, Python internally calls C functions like connect, send, and receive, which are part of your system's POSIX sockets API. And the same is true for most languages. Python wraps C socket API via standard library, whereas Java uses JNI to call native socket API, Go uses syscalls from the net package, Rust uses bindings, and C, C++ calls POSIX socket API directly. So yeah, any language can create sockets as long as it can talk to the OS. But under the hood, it's almost always using C-based system calls. These functions are implemented inside your operating system kernel, both Linux or Mac OS. And again, syscalls here are like the doorbell to the OS kernel. Your code rings it. The kernel opens the door and does the work. Now here is the key part. On Linux and Mac OS, socket-related syscalls follow the POSIX standard. So functions like socket, connect, and send are part of the Unix-style syscall interface. On Windows, the idea is the same, but the API is different. Windows has its own socket API called WinSock or Windows Sockets. So instead of POSIX-style syscalls, it uses functions like WSA socket or WSA receives, etc. But at a high level, it's the same idea. Your code asks, the OS kernel does, and network hardware sends. Now imagine this. Your server is running and thousands of users are connected at the same time. Behind the scenes, that's thousands of open sockets. But here is the question. How do you handle all of them without your CPU melting down? If you natively check each socket, like, hey, socket one got data. No, socket two, nothing. Socket three, that wastes time. You are polling sockets that aren't even doing anything. And this is where ePoll on Linux and KQ on Mac OS or BSD step in. And they are game changers. Instead of manually looping over every socket, they flip the model. You tell the OS, here is list of my sockets. Just tap me when any of them have data. And the OS replies, cool. Only these fives are active. Go deal with them. No need to check all 10,000. Just focus on the ones that actually need attention. And this is the backbone of how modern high-performance servers scale. Take a server like Nginx. It uses a tiny set of event loop workers powered by ePoll or KQ. Only the ready sockets, the ones with real traffic, get processed. So instead of checking every line constantly, it only picks up the ones that are ringing. Now, you're probably wondering, 
how many sockets can a server even handle? Technically a lot, but it depends on OS level limits like file descriptors, RAM and CPU, network card and kernel tuning. Here is a rough idea. For dev laptop, it would be around 10,000 to 50K. For small servers with 32 GB RAM and eight cores, it can be about 100K to 200K. And for large production servers with say 256 GB RAM, it could be up to 1 million. But in real world production, admins usually tune this up using the command U limit and set kernel parameters like this. So now we know how powerful sockets can be and how tools like ePole and KQ help scale them to massive levels. But here is a twist. Not all sockets are built for the same purpose. There's a difference between the raw sockets we have been talking about and something you might have heard if you have ever built web apps. Yes, I'm talking about web sockets. Let's break that down. Socket is the foundational building block. It's a low level two way communication channel, usually over TCP or sometimes UDP. Think of it like setting up a direct phone line between two machines. You control how messages are sent, you define the format, and it's perfect for backend systems like game servers, IoT devices, anything custom. But here's the catch. It's not built for the browser. And that is where web sockets come in. They sit on top of regular TCP sockets, but they are browser friendly. A web socket connection starts just like an ordinary HTTP request like this. But then it upgrades to a persistent full duplex connection, meaning both the browser and the server can send messages at any time. No polling, no waiting, no repeated request. For example, let's say you are building a real-time chat app in the browser. You could use web sockets to keep the connection open between the client and server. So when one user sends a message, it appears instantly on the other side. No need to refresh, no delay. This is what powers modern apps like Slack, WhatsApp web, live dashboards, stock tickers, you name it. And yes, I have covered this in detail in my WebSockets deep dive video, if you want to explore more. From raw mm. TCP connections to modern web sockets powering your favorite apps, whether you're building a multiplayer game server, streaming real-time data, or wiring up a simple chat between two machines, it all starts with one thing, a socket. And if this gave you a clear picture of how sockets work, hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe. I've got deep dives coming up on web sockets, Nginx internals, and even how multiplayer games handle real-time networking. Thanks for watching. Until next time, stay curious, stay connected.